invite you to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. It's going to read verses 15 through 19. In case you haven't noticed, I, I get excited about when things go well. I get excited about winning. I get equally as not excited about not winning. And so it's, uh, <laughs> I go to the extremes and I don't know, it is what it is. And so, uh, but uh, this is exciting. In verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God <coughs> fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun your reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of the covenant. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. We finally get to the seventh trumpet, and this is a good one. This is a really good one. Loud voices in heaven proclaiming the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he will reign forever and ever. You may recognize that from a popular Christmas song. I was going to try to sing that this morning, but you know how hard that is to sing? That's like an eight-part harmony kind of thing. I, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it'd be hard for us to sing. And so, uh, but it said, he shall reign forever and ever. But listen to those words closely again. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Something changed. Something changed. One kingdom became another all of a sudden. In a place where someone or something used to reign, somebody else now reigns. That's a change. That's a transition. That's what they call a transition of power. Somebody who was once in charge now isn't in charge. Somebody else is in charge. Jesus has dealt with sin. Sin used to reign in the world. And when you look around and watch the news, it looks like it still does. There's obviously still sin in the world. There's still a sin problem in the world. But it no longer reigns because now Jesus does. And he will reign. How long? Forever and ever. Now that's a little bit of emphasis there. Because now when I say forever, what does that mean? It means forever. What does forever and ever mean? It's like infinity plus one. You know, uh, do you need, is, is there, is there, it's the eternity and then some. You know, uh, what was that one movie the guy said, to infinity and beyond? There is no beyond. It, it's, 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 it, it's, 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 it's everything, forever and ever. The 24 elders weigh in in verse 16. Those seated on their thrones before God fall on their faces and worship and say, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty. The one who is and who was, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. Before us, anything else, there's something seriously huge to know here. If you go back in Revelation and look at chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8, the Lord God is addressed as who is, who was, and who is to come. But in verse 11, 17, the Lord is to come is no longer there, and that's not an accident. John didn't make a mistake, it's not a typo. John is seeing a vision into the spiritual realm. He's seeing the spiritual realm and the physical realm are so intertwined that they cannot really be understood separately. Something happened when Jesus came that radically changed the course of history. Now, people can pretend that it didn't. Many people pretend that it didn't. They can even pretend that all the philosophies in the world are the same. And that we Christians are simply following one way among many. You hear some Christians saying, oh, there's lots of ways. Jesus is just a better way. It simply isn't true. There's something about the cross that is radically different than any other belief system out there. And it isn't enough just to be good and to do nice things and live happily ever after. Jesus has come. He's been here. And in Revelation 11, 17, when they give thanks to the one who is and who was, Jesus, John is no longer pointing to what is to come because Jesus has come. He's taken his great power and he's begun to reign. He is reigning right now. Now, from the right hand of the Father. And verse 18 says, The nations were angry, 
and your wrath has come. The time for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, most small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. See, the nations are angry. Anger is a natural reaction to judgment when one sense the judgment isn't going to go in their favor. Some people have a fit when the word judgment is even mentioned. <laughs> but the time has come. The time has come. You might remember back in chapter 6, those that were under the altar crying out, How long? How long? And they're told to wait a little longer. They're given to wait a little longer. Well, they aren't waiting anymore. They've been redeemed. You and I, if we've repented, if you repent of your sin, you believe in Jesus, we were under the altar. We were under the covenant. He's been redeemed. That's why we can sing that song, Redeemed. How I love to birth Raymond. Right? We're redeemed. We're not, we're not waiting to be redeemed. We've been redeemed. That's good stuff. And I've said it a lot, and I'll say it some more. Something happened when Jesus came. When he suffered and died and rose from the grave, verse 19 points that out again. God's temple in heaven was open. And when his temple was seen, the Ark of the Covenant, what happened when Jesus died on the cross in the temple? The curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And the curtain keeping us from seeing into the Holy of Holies was torn in two. And at the same time, the spiritual realm, the temple of heaven, was open. And when Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on the people of Pentecost, he was empowering us with the presence of God to go and make disciples. And when the presence of God is here, powerful things happen. In Jesus' day, in what John was seeing, there was flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hellstorm. That's all powerful stuff. That's the effect Jesus had when he came. And that's the effect we should have on the world. And I think we are. Look at how angry people are. People get angry when things don't go their way. Did you, did you ever get angry when things don't go your way? I do sometimes. I mean, why should I? I got a homie glory again without signs the sun. Okay, so something here didn't know my way. What do you do? I gotta go. The nations are angry because things aren't going their way. Now, until they decide to believe in Jesus, things are ever going to go their way. But there's a spiritual attack coming against us from many angles, some within, some without. Sometimes we get stuck wanting to sit back and just hope that Jesus comes and makes everything right. And in one sense, that's all we can really do. But in another sense, Jesus has already been here. He's already done that. He's dealt with sin. It's been defeated. Obviously, there's still a mess to clean up. It's not any different when the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. The land was all theirs. But what did they have to do? They had to take it. They had to fight the battles. And when they listened to the Lord, they went, well, remember Jericho? Jericho was a good. They started off and they, they, they walked through Jericho. But then later on, they made a treaty with people. They made a deal with people that they shouldn't have dealt with. They should have destroyed. And if we don't destroy what needs to be destroyed, if we make deals with it, then it's going to destroy us. And we can see if we Study history. That's there's a reason they say if you don't learn from history, you can never repeat it. I don't have enough time to make the same stupid mistakes I've watched other people make. I make enough of my own. I don't want to make the same one I watch somebody else do. But when they compromise, when they would listen to the Lord, went good. When they compromised and made a treaty, went badly very quickly. And to this day, to this very day, they are still at war over that piece of ground on the eastern bank of the Mediterranean Sea. Are they not? They're still fighting about who owns that. That's been a long time. They still don't like each other. Our war today isn't about a piece of ground here in this world. We want to, we want to make it about that. Too many people want to make it about that. It's not. It's about our home in heaven. It's about bringing people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. If we do that, we can't be defeated. But if we don't, we can't survive. Our war today is all about bringing people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Where does Satan want to make his mark? He wants to have people thinking. In, in, did, you ever, did you ever watch some of the news and, and listen to some people, some of the arguments they try to make? And you're sitting there thinking, who in the right mind would argue for that kind of stuff? But they do because they're not in the right mind because they're thinking like Satan. You know, we're, not, we're, not, we're no longer waiting for Messiah to come to deal with sin. Notice that this victory song that they launch into doesn't come at the end of Revelation, it comes right smack in the middle. The place where God establishes his kingdom. Because what Jesus did on the cross is at the end, it's the center. Remember, remember the slide? The cross in the center? 
extending into in both directions, Jesus is the centerpiece. He's not the end of the story. He's the center. He's all that matters. And when we say, you know, we, we put Jesus first, he's the center of our lives. <laughs> he isn't. Jesus is a kid. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, that he will reign forever and ever, and that's why we sing. That's why we celebrate. That's why we come and partake of the body and blood of Christ. We're proclaiming in his death that salvation is found only in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is king, and that makes the nations angry. It really does. Those who would rather be kings themselves aren't happy about there being a new king in Jesus. They don't like that. They don't like competition. Judgment has come. And those who revere the name of the Lord are rewarded. Those men on the structure are destroyed. In the meantime, we sing this victory song. We proclaim his death until he comes again. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the victory. Lord, that even overcomes our faith. Lord, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your state? Lord, we pray, Lord, as, as we come this morning, as we partake of what you've done for us, Lord, let it become real in our hearts. Lord. Again, even though, we, Lord, we've done this lots of times and we do it lots more, Lord, let it not just be something we do. Let it, be, let it become who we are, the very essence of who we are, because of what you've done. And you are reigning forever and ever. Bless us, Lord, as we prepare your table. The Lord, in your presence, in your name. Amen.